Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, I want to have plenty of time to talk to you about uh, Fiddler and uh, give you some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to just leap right into it. Though before I start, I would like to ask one question. How many people have used Fiddler before? Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to probably breeze through some of the preliminary stuff, but one of the things that I do want to give you is some context into you know, where Fiddler came from, why this is the first presentation you've ever seen about Fiddler from Microsoft, uh, and basically you know, the things that you can do with the tool that perhaps you didn't know about or maybe weren't entirely clear. And so let's dive in. So the first thing is, uh, I'm Eric Lawrence. I'm a program manager on the Internet Explorer team. I was not, however, always a program manager doing networking on the Internet Explorer team. Uh, back in the day, I joined Microsoft back in 2001, and uh, I was the PM for Clipart. And I was very happy as the PM for Clipart. It was great, basically. Every day, we had about a, thousand, or a, about a million people downloading Clipart from our website. And we were integrating Clipart into the Office 2000, uh, XP and then 2003 client experience. And so we had this client server application that would download Clipart from the web and allow the user to use it. Now, as you can imagine, most users of this application are not super sophisticated technical folks. But the other thing that's really interesting about it is the people that were building the application were traditional client developers. They were not web developers in general. And these were some of the first early high volume, high scale web service client server interactions. And this led to a very interesting problem. And that is, if anything went wrong, it was almost inscrutable as to what to do about it. And so this is what happens when the client pane is uh, having a problem with the web service. Basically, you get these weird ASPX things in there. And you know, I had just joined the team. I was new to Microsoft. Previously, I'd done some web development work. But I was not a hardcore web guy. I knew what HTTP was in the general sense, but I didn't really know what it was. And so you know, I was in my developer's office one day when he was having a problem like this. And, and how did he choose to debug it? Well, at the time, there were basically two options. The first one on the left is what this developer was using. Basically, he had a breakpoint in his ASPX code, and he had, a, he had a byte array containing the HTTP request, and so he hovered over it to get the tooltip and was painstakingly reading this get request in hex. And I said, this, this clearly can't be the best way to do this. Netmon, Netmon is the way. And this is back in the day when Netmon was a bit frozen for a while, Netmon 2. They hadn't added a bunch of features in a long time. It was not nearly as feature rich as it is today. But basically, Netmon had this problem that it was a pretty hardcore tool. You saw literally everything flying over the network. And if you wanted to do any kind of filtering or eliminate things that weren't even going to your machine, these things required a deep insight. And so the reality is, is that basically none of the testers on the team were using Netmon, and developers were doing crazy things like hovering over to get tooltips in Visual Studio. And being a program manager you know, out to save the world and make the world safe for Clipart, I said, there's got to be a better way than this. And so the first thing I did was I said, well, wh where would I put something? And something immediately comes to mind is, hey, let's be a proxy, right? A proxy operates at a very privileged part of the, the, the whole stack. I get to see literally everything coming over HTTP and HTTPS. I won't see any of that inscrutable ARP traffic or any other stuff that's going on. I'll just see the HTTP and HTTPS traffic. And so that would be a huge improvement over what we saw previously. The other advantage of being a proxy is most applications will support proxies. Because if they don't, you generally can't sell them to organizations because organizations want things that go through proxies. So I said, hey, if I'm a proxy, I'm not going to be married to one particular technology. I'm not going to build an office plugin and then you know, go try and apply it to something else and have it utterly fail. And I'm not going to build an Internet Explorer plugin, which is specific to Internet Explorer. It would never work if I wanted to debug in a different browser. So I said, the proxy approach is promising. What can I do? So the first thing is, I just went out and I just grabbed, a, there was a very simple uh, C++ proxy. And I just modified it a very little bit so that it would emit all the traffic that flowed over to the console. And this was probably a, a day long job, which was kind of impressive since I didn't really know C++ to any measurable degree. And people loved it. And it was a horrible experience. You'd load a web page and you'd get 9,000 lines in your console output. And if any of it was binary, your, your, your system bell would be going beep, 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 beep. It was horrible, and they loved it. Every developer started using it, the test team started using it, and I said, wow, this is kind of embarrassing, but it's kind of cool. 
And so I said, well, you know, clearly I want to do more than this. Now, about that time, I was into security, and something else interesting came up. And that was, I went to a security talk with the office security team, and they, told, they mentioned this anecdote that the most popular shopping cart site on the internet, the way that it passed prices around was in hidden form fields. And so you could modify the hidden form fields to set whatever price you want and buy whatever you want at whatever price. And I thought, this is utterly preposterous. There's no way such a hole exists. But I said, well, I've been meaning to build an IE plugin, so I built an IE plugin using Delphi, and what it would do is when you did a, a navigation in Internet Explorer, it would just pop up a little box that would allow you to edit the, HTTP, or the, the request that was being sent. It wasn't quite at the HTTP level, it was interrupting web browser events. And so I built this thing called Tamper IE, and Tamper IE does literally just that. It allows you to tamper with these post bodies and so forth. In the process, I found out that, yes, actually, it is quite true that a great deal of sites on the Internet at the time did allow you to set your own prices in this way. Uh, the one site that actually um, I didn't think was vulnerable, I was just playing around. Um, on the final page, you know, it looked like they protected everything. On the final page, I set the shipping charge to be like negative $40 and, uh, you know, clicked submit, assuming I'd get an error back. And they said, oh, great, here's your order. It'll be $2, and it was a $42 item. <laughs> so I sent the mail, and I said, hey, guys, you have this bug. You know, you got to go close it, and, you know, please charge me the right, uh, right thing for my order. And, you know, I got the response back of, oh, you can have the thing for $2, but tell us what you did. Um, <laughs> So that was fun, and, and you know, at the time, I'm, I was a, a, year, a year out of school, perhaps, and, and it was kind of cool to start getting this feedback from people that, you know, the tool sets were so weak at the time, and I looked around, and at the time, the only thing I found was Achilles, which was this really, really primitive proxy. And I said, you know, there's, there's really an opportunity here to help my team out and, and to do fun little security test things. And so, you know, I basically, knowing nothing, didn't know .NET at all, didn't know HTTP at all, I bought the two books and I sat down and for uh, many weekends in a row, uh, basically I wrote code. And uh, this was workable because at the time I had no girlfriend and no social life and so this is what I did. And uh, after, you know, a couple of months, this is basically what I had. I had Fiddler version one, it was built on .NET 1.1 and the first release that, that I did was in October 2003. And it was very, very primitive. It supported, you know, the very basics of viewing HTTP, but it didn't support things like chunked encoding, certainly didn't support SSL, it didn't support authentication. It was very, very primitive. Uh, the code was abysmal. Uh, it was really, really terrible. Imagine a program manager, not a professional developer, uh, learning C Sharp and building uh, a product out of it. And that's pretty much what, what Fiddler version one looked like. Um, well, over the years, six years, uh, 17,000 lines of C Sharp, 51 release builds, and uh, a conservative estimate of 700 cans of uh, Diet Mountain Dew, uh, I ended up where I am today. Now, this is a little bit misleading because in addition to the you know, 51 release builds, I probably did 200 beta builds, and the 17K lines of C++, is, or C Sharp is where it's at now. I probably wrote about 50,000 lines of C Sharp and just deleted the 33 that were not very good, and uh, did a lot of refactoring, and, and over the years, when I moved from .NET 1.1 to .NET 2, the framework, you know, adopted some of the stuff and made some of the, some of the things much, uh, much easier to do. My favorite was when I added NTLM support. The initial version of NTLM support was three pages of C-sharp code. Uh, it's currently, I think, six lines of C-sharp code with a paragraph comment at the top explaining how it works. And so as I learned things, the product got simpler, which I saw as a good sign, and, and my skills got a little bit better. And so here's where Fiddler is today. Basically, Fiddler is a fairly rich, uh, powerful application. It's written on, do on top of .NET 2.0. It's using WinForms. Uh, it's making extremely heavy use of threading. Uh, it's basically written against the sockets, so it's not using any of the web request classes or things like that. It's just you know, talking directly to the sockets. Made it a little prettier because screenshots you know, are kind of important, and, and it turns out that management likes graphs, and so uh, that was something that I built in. Uh, but, you know, the big thing, the big win for, extens for, for Fiddler, and the reason that actually we're here at all, probably, is that I was pretty lazy when I built Fiddler. And we had this query UI at, at Microsoft to search for bugs in, in a tool called Product Studio. And basically, it's this grid UI, and you say, I want this field to be that, and I want this field to be that, and it filters it down. And filtration is a really important thing if you're looking at a lot of network traffic, because you're going to end up with hundreds or thousands of requests, and you're only interested in probably a few of them. And I said, well, I, I want to build this product studio like UI. And I looked at how complicated it would be and exact offsets, and I've got to make boxes appear and disappear. And man, it would be really easy if just my customers would write a little bit of you know, C Sharp and, and do the filtering themselves. 
And I said, hey, wait, that's an idea. And there was an article at the time in MSDN Magazine about how you can just put the script engine for, for JavaScript or VBScript in your application. And I said, well, that seems pretty easy. And in fact, it was. It was about a page of code. And so that's where Fiddler script came from, was this, you know, I just wanted a really quick and simple way to filter traffic down to the stuff that people cared about. Well, over time, basically, Fiddler script written in JavaScript.net wasn't enough for a lot of people because while JavaScript is the choice of many web developers, uh, JavaScript.net has its own weird little quirks. And uh, Fiddler got used more and more by people who were building desktop applications interacting with web services. And they wanted to use C Sharp and other, and other languages. And so over time, basically, I extended and made more rich the extensibility model for Fiddler. So you can extend Fiddler using JavaScript. You can do it with C Sharp. You can do it with any .NET language. And we'll talk at the end about kind of where this is all going. But there's, there's three principal ways in which you can extend Fiddler and customize it for your environment. The first is using inspectors. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. But inspectors allow you to view HTTP traffic in, in a particular context. So the image inspector, for instance, will show you an image as an image rather than showing you a raw byte stream. Well, you can build these inspectors for whatever content type that you have that you can interpret. So at Microsoft, people have built these to interpret like the Silverlight zap files. So you double click on the XAP file, and you actually see all the contents, and you can just walk through the metadata. Someone wrote one for the Shockwave uh, Flash format, so you double click on the Swift, and you get the action script source. They decompile it and just do it in the text. It's pretty cool. Uh, but you can write your own. Fiddler ships with a set, but you can write your own. And so this makes it very useful for application-specific things. In Office, I built some inspectors that would use the client-server format between Clipart and the server, so you could actually get a better, richer view rather than going to raw XML. The Fiddler extension interface, iFiddler extension, is actually really kind of the, the browser helper object model, if you guys are familiar with that, which is basically, you know, I'll load your DLL into my process, and then you can party on my menus and do whatever you want uh, with the you break it, you bought it philosophy of if you corrupt the menu, it's just not going to work right, and people will uninstall your extension. Uh, but it's very powerful if you want to build your own sorts of reporting or export or interaction with other types of tools. And then Fiddler script itself, of course, is you know, the thing that's been in there forever. You can write JavaScript and really easily manipulate or filter on traffic. For external people, there's this concept of, uh, there's an executable called execaction.exe. And all execaction.exe is it sends a string to the extension model in Fiddler and says, hey, here's a command. Anybody want it? And that command might be save the traffic out to a file, or go load this other website, or delete everything that's an image. And so people have started to use exec action as kind of a lightweight tooling or test automation facility. And we'll talk about where that's all going very soon. Now, we're going to go over to Fiddler. Um, this is going to be very interesting for me. Normally, I do Internet Explorer security demos. And so if anything breaks, I can just kind of giggle and say, oh, we're going to fix that. But in the case of Fiddler, all the bugs are my fault. So if anything blows up, it's, it's really my fault. OK. So basically, Fiddler, on the left-hand side, has the web sessions list, has a list of all the HTTP, HTTPS sessions that have been captured by Fiddler. And on the right-hand side, we have a broad pane that contains uh, both the extensions and the inspectors. And so, you know, just starting out from the beginning, we have our built-in statistics tab, which will show you the statistics of the selected traffic, including the timeline and times and so forth. We have the pretty mime type chart at the bottom that allows, the, allows you to see the breakdown of traffic by, by mime type. So you can say, well, in this case, we're using lots of HTML because I've only got one session selected. But if I select a bunch, we'll see, wow, more than, more than half of this page is actually, or roughly half of this page is using JavaScript. And so if we want to make performance optimizations, that's a good place to start to look at. The inspectors, uh, as I mentioned, you can inspect the HTTP requests and responses, and we'll, learn, we'll, we'll go through those individually in a minute. The autoresponder we'll talk about in, at length. The request builder is kind of an interesting one. A request builder allows you to drag and drop sessions out of the session list and then make modifications and reissue those requests. Now, that won't go to the browser. It won't show the results anywhere. You can examine it within Fiddler. It's very useful for testing web services. Um, I know some of the security guys use it for pen testing web services. Uh, gallery is a plugin. It's an extension. And basically, what the gallery extension does is when you uh, select traffic, it'll actually go and find all the images in that traffic uh, over a certain size. Um, and it will show them in that list there. Uh, it's very useful if you're surfing around a, a website and you want to collect. I, I use this for my brother's wedding photos. He published it on some site that didn't have an export. And so I just saved all the images out uh, in raw format. 
Fiddler script is a plugin that shows your Fiddler script uh, so you can edit it directly in. It's got syntax highlighting. It's got uh, a very primitive form of IntelliSense. Um, and it allows you to, to do your, your manipulations of requests and responses. And you can add new UI. You can add new columns to the session list. It's a fairly powerful language. Uh, and we'll talk about the future of that language shortly. The Filters tab is a built-in extension. It allows you to do filtration of traffic and lightweight tampering and modification. The timeline is one of the more interesting ones. The perf guys always get excited about this because it shows the progression of requests over time. And so this can be very useful, for instance, because sometimes you'll see a clearly degenerate case where the page is clearly waiting on some resource. And no matter how fast all the rest of the resources are, unless you make that one resource faster, you're not going to get your page going faster. And then Differ is a plugin which uh, basically allows you to compare two sets of traffic. The Differ plugin uh, probably shouldn't even be on the demo machine because it's not, uh, it's not very good right now. But uh, Fiddler is a work in progress. Oops, wrong direction. OK, so basically, I'm going to walk through, I think it's four or five different sets of scenarios of how you can use Fiddler. Some of these you probably know about very clearly. Some of these you probably have never seen before, I hope. And uh, we'll go from there. So the first thing to understand about Fiddler is where it lives in the overall architecture. So as a proxy, uh, basically, because it plugs in very closely with Internet Explorer, there's a button in the IE toolbar, for instance, people assume it's an IE extension. And the reality is it's just not so. Fiddler is a proxy. It's a full-fledged proxy server. It can proxy HTTP, HTTPS. It can do FTP, but it's off by default because you have to have an upstream proxy to do FTP. Um, but basically, the reason that it so seamlessly works with Internet Explorer is because when Fiddler starts, basically, it goes out to the WinINET stack and says, hey, I'm your system, system proxy, please use me for all traffic. It turns out that Windows has no concept of a system proxy, per se. There's just the WinINET proxy, which Internet Explorer, Office, most Microsoft applications use. And because of that, most other applications will pick it up as well. So Google Chrome will pick it up. Opera will pick it up as long as you stop, start Opera after having changed the proxy. Uh, most browsers will pick it up. The one that doesn't is Firefox. Firefox doesn't respect the WinINET settings. If you change your WinINET settings, uh, basically nothing will happen in Firefox. You have to literally go manually point Fiddler at, or go point Firefox at Fiddler to see traffic from Firefox. I talked to the Firefox team about this, and I said, hey, here's this thing, blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, submit the patch and we'll consider it. And I said, well, that's kind of unfortunate. Um, so what I did was I built an extension. And this is a relatively recent addition to Fiddler. It goes down in the status bar and has the ability to dynamically hook the proxy in Firefox up to Fiddler if Fiddler is running and leave it off otherwise. And so you can easily decide, I always want traffic to go to Fiddler regardless of whether or not it's working. And if, if Fiddler is, for instance, not running at the time, uh, you'll just get proxy errors. Uh, you can turn off proxying of traffic to Fiddler, or you can use Fiddler automatically. So when Fiddler's capturing, Firefox will use it. And when Fiddler's not capturing, Firefox won't use it. And so through this extension and the fact that it registers as the WinIONET system proxy, you'll see traffic from pretty much all the applications that support HTTP and HTTPS. Now, applications that are running on other machines are a really interesting case. So I've had a bunch of people say, hey, I've got a smartphone, and I, I really want to debug some HTTP traffic, or I want to use it with a Mac, or I want to use it with my Linux box, or, or whatnot. And because Fiddler is a proxy server, it means that essentially anything that actually supports a proxy server can use Fiddler. And so people on the, the Pocket PC team and now the, the Windows Mobile team will use Fiddler to debug their HTTP traffic for some of their scenarios. Um, we've got people that, that do Mac clients, and they'll point their, their Mac client at the window, Windows machine running Fiddler. And so as a proxy server, you can see traffic from any machine that wants to send it to you. And all you have to do is change the config switch to Fiddler to allow it to proxy external traffic. Now, for application developers, things are kind of interesting, because most applications will silently pick up the WinINET proxy, particularly if you've written in .NET or if you're using WinINET with the standard settings. But it's possible to actually not use the system proxy in your applications. Uh, Java, for instance, I think you have to pass a command line parameter, dash u or whatnot. Uh, but for .NET applications, the easy way to ensure that your HTTP, HTTPS traffic is going through Fiddler is just to change your app config and set it so that bypass on local is false and that use system default proxy is true. And then your HTTP, HTTPS traffic is going to flow through Fiddler. If you wanted to in your code, you could actually just manually set the, the proxy objects if you wanted. Uh, 
one of the interesting challenges, however, about both WinINet and System.net and sometimes in some other applications is that by default, they won't actually proxy traffic to HTTP 127.0.0.1 because they say, hey, that's loopback adapter. I don't want to talk to a proxy server. Well, for a debug proxy server like Fiddler that's running on localhost, that's fairly problematic. And so Fiddler has this basically magic host name, ipv4.fiddler. If you, if you use that host name while Fiddler is running, it will just point back at your loopback adapter. And so if you have the flexibility of changing the URL that you're requesting, you can just use ipv4.fiddler. This is particularly useful for the Visual Studio web server, Cassini. And the reason is, is that by default, that, that web server will only listen on your IPv4 interface. And on a Vista or a Win7 machine, by default, it's going to try and use the IPv6 interface. And it will actually fail because it's not going to find a, a web server listening at that location. And so you can use IPv4.fiddler to actually get traffic from applications that otherwise wouldn't normally proxy that traffic. There's a whole page on the Fiddler website about how to get Fiddler working for whatever your crazy scenario is, whether it's PHP or Java or .NET or classic ASP and so forth. Now, in the case where you can't make a modification at all to the client, sort of the last ditch effort is you can run Fiddler as a reverse proxy. So you can put Fiddler on your machine running on whatever port you want, including port 80, and have it forward traffic to a different port. So you can have your IIS server or your Apache server running on port 81, for instance, and just silently proxy the traffic between those ports. I don't recommend you do this in production. Fiddler isn't designed for that level of load. It's really about testing. But in the case that you can't modify the client at all, there's a hard-coded URL or something like that, it's a good alternative. Now, the other thing that I always get eyebrows raised for is the fact that Fiddler does HTTPS traffic decryption, because the more you know about HTTPS, the more you know that it's supposed to prevent exactly this attack. And the way that this works is Fiddler executes what's, what's a classic man-in-the-middle attack for SSL. It essentially tells the client, I'll be your server. Here's my certificate. And the certificate that it hands back is a certificate that it's self-generated. And so by default, it's not trusted by your browser, and you'll get a cert error page. And to the server, basically, it just says, hi, I'm your client. I would like this request. And because there's no mutual authentication without client certs, it just works. If you want to use client certs, you can actually use, you can configure Fiddler to pick a particular client cert out of your store if you want. Now, in some scenarios, this just isn't enough because, in, in, you know, for instance, system.net, the default would be to reject a, client, a connection to the server that has an invalid certificate. And in the browser, you'll get the red error page, which is kind of annoying. And so if you want, on a test machine, don't do this in production again, you can trust the do not trust fiddler route, and then all of your security prompts and warnings will go away. For obvious reasons, this isn't a configuration that I advise to people in general. The one thing that's interesting, every time I, I, I mention this, security guys are like, wait a minute, I can totally hack your machine if you ever do this. And the answer is no, not quite. And the reason is because Fiddler generates a new route for every machine that it runs on. And so if you were to persuade somebody to you know, go to your site, which is secured by a Fiddler root certificate, and you know they have Fiddler, it actually would completely fail with a crazy error in IE because it would find, wait a minute, I'm walking back the cert chain, and the root cert doesn't match the root cert in the cert store. It's total failure. And so it's not as dangerous as some people would, would lead you to believe. But it's certainly not an option that you, you want to take, undertake lightly. You should do it for testing. The, the screenshot down there was the very first thing I ever did with this. I, I discreetly made a little modification to my Fidelity page on the wire while somebody was you know, just in my office and they happened to look up and realize that they were sitting with a nine billionaire. And they were very, very unhappy to hear that this was actually just a little trick that I played on them and that I was not buying them a boat. OK, well, capturing traffic is part of it. But it turns out that it's, it's usually not all that you want. Very often, you want to actually do something with that traffic that involves archiving it in some way. Fiddler has a ton of options for this. The very lightweight ones were all designed around the fact that I was filing bug reports out of Fiddler all the time when I first, when I first built it. And so you can copy the requests and the responses to the clipboard. You can either copy the headers only, or you can copy the whole request body and, and so forth. You can store these in a plain text file if you want. This seems to be the very common method of doing it is they, they go save the entire thing as a text file. Generally speaking, please don't do that. It's a horrible format. It should only be used if you really only need text. A common scenario is to extract the binary response body. So I showed the gallery viewer where you can export all the images. Well, sometimes you want to export other types. You want to export, you know, I want all the Swift files or all the executables or something like that. And so you can save those files uh, 
multiple at a time, just drop them all in a folder if you want. You can write a little bit of script code or write an extension to archive traffic to a database. And so this is pretty common for test use. They'll actually archive an entire crawl of a website to a database. And then the next time there's a drop of the website, they'll actually drop that to the database too. And so they get the, the history of the website over time and they can make comparisons like are we adding more resources, fewer, are we getting faster or slower? You can export to a Visual Studio web test file. Uh, this is pretty much the only part of Fiddler that I didn't write myself. The Visual Studio web test team uh, did it. They wrote a plugin that would export to web tests, and they said, you know, this was their prototype for, for their upcoming feature, and they, they said they liked the prototype so much, could I just ship it for them? Uh, and so this is very nice. So if you've got Visual Studio web test, you can actually go reissue requests out of a web test file and, you know, build a lot of logic and automation around it. And so that's pretty useful. And then the last thing, you can write your own. And so, for instance, right now there's, there's a, a proposal floating around for a JSON format for HTTP traffic archive. Uh, and they're trying to build this standard set of tools that would operate across these different types of traffic. And so Firebug has an exporter for it. HTTP Watch has an exporter for it. Well, Fiddler, you can write an importer and exporter for it. Now, because this is a defined format, it's something I'm gonna try to do myself. But if you don't wanna wait for me, really there's nothing stopping you, it's pretty easy. The most important export format, however, is the SAS file format. SAS is session archive zip. And session archive zip is, is very useful because it's a non-lossy format. It contains the entire request and response, all of the bytes of both. It contains timing and other meta metadata, so you can see how the response was loaded over the network and, and look at that data later. And there's an HTML index file. And the HTML index file is there because back in the day when nobody had Fiddler, people would get these SAS files and say, what do I do with this? And the answer was, well, rename it to .zip and open the .zip file, and inside there's an HTML file. And when you click on the links in the HTML file, you can see the raw requests and responses. It's kind of useful, but now that Fiddler is a rather common tool, I don't think anybody has actually done this in quite a while. Another important point about SAS files is it supports zip en en encryption. So if you can either do the standard default, uh, you know, easy to break zip encryption, or you can actually use AES-256. And this is pretty useful because some people have started taking traffic captures of things like bank websites and mailing them to people. You generally don't want to do that except to anyone you truly trust, and more than that, you really want to make sure that you're keeping those, those data sessions uh, encrypted so that anybody on the wire doesn't have the opportunity to go look at that traffic. Now the fun thing about the SAS file format is that it's very useful to get remote debug repros from people who are, you know, off somewhere else. When we were doing the Internet Explorer 7 beta, we had this problem where people would say, hey, my site doesn't work, and we'd say, what's the URL? And they'd say, well, we can't give it to you because it's this inter internal thing, it wouldn't work. There's no proprietary data on it, but, you know, it's just inside the firewall, we can't help you. And so what we said is, well, hey, grab a traffic capture and send it to us, and we can actually take a look at that in our environment. And at the time, actually, I was, you know, I sent all these requests to totally non-technical people, and almost all of them did it successfully, but I thought, that's kind of ridiculous. I really need to make a lightweight way to get these captures. And that's where FiddlerCap came from. If you go to FiddlerCap.com, there's like these, you know, I think it's a six or seven step checklist of what you do, which basically is you download the tool, you push start, you do whatever's broken, you push stop, and you push save. And then you can save this SAS file off and mail it to whoever has, whoever's going to debug your problem. The Hotmail team currently uses this when people are having problems logging into their accounts. They say, hey, go get this tool, it's pretty simple. The Fiddler Cap thing hasn't been updated in a while, but I'm gonna talk at the end about some interesting things that are coming for it. The main thing that I really wanna do is get this localized into lots of different languages so that you could use this in a more worldwide context. But the overall idea is lightweight capture, non-technical people, don't impact the system, be very simple and it just exports the same SAS files that you can go import in the full Fiddler tool. Now, once you've collected this traffic from people, what do you do with it? And here's where traffic analysis comes into play. Fiddler has a lot of features around allowing you to analyze traffic. The first thing, as I mentioned, however, is that before you start the analysis, very often there's things that you want to ignore. While you're doing a capture, you can, you can set options on the rules menu like ignore images or HTTPS connects, things that you might not care about for your context. If you're a JavaScript developer, for instance, you're probably not too interested in what the images are unless it happens to be where the problem lies. And so you can use the rules menu options to filter pretty quickly. We also have an application type filter, which you'll find down in the status bar. And the status bar basically allows you to filter quickly between all processes, web browsers, non-browser traffic, or temporarily hide all. Sorry, this doesn't scale very well. It's not really designed for the presentation uh, view. 
And what this will do is it'll allow you to really quickly say, I'm a, I'm a web developer, you know, I, I only want to see HTTP traffic that's coming from my browser, or I'm building a web service and I, I use MSDN all the time, I don't want to see any traffic that's going out from my browser because I'm constantly using it. So that's the simplest thing that you can pivot between, just capture between certain classes of applications. There's new features, however, that get even more granular than that. So one of them is the process filter, where you can actually filter traffic down to a specific instance. So for instance, I can load up this Internet Explorer instance here, and I can use the process filter and say, I only want to see traffic from Internet Explorer process ID 5784. And no matter what you do in other browsers or in other types of uh, other tabs in this browser with IE8 where we run different, different tabs and different processes, that traffic won't appear here. And so it's very useful to get that filtration done. The next way that you can filter is you can actually use the filters tab. And in the filters tab, you can set certain requirements like I only want to see traffic to certain hosts or, or I, I want to see traffic except for certain hosts. Uh, you can do the process filtration. You can say, oh, well, I don't want to see RSS traffic. Uh, you can filter on response codes. So basically, I could hide everything except 200 codes so that you know, I only want to see the errors. You can filter on content type. I only want to see JavaScript. You can actually filter on size as well and say, I only want to see things that are larger than 20K or smaller than 20K. And so this allows you to narrow down the scope of what you've captured pretty quickly. Now, beyond these, Oftentimes, you'll find, okay, well, I got a complete log. And so this, this here is actually a, a log of all of the traffic which has been captured uh, from the, the PDC homepage that I loaded. The quick exec box, this, this big black box down at the bottom, is essentially a command line for Fiddler. It allows you to trigger those commands that I mentioned earlier. But it also has some additional capabilities for traffic filtration. So I can do things like select JavaScript, and it will actually select the script files that are available. Now, if I were to hit shift delete right now, it would delete everything except for those script files. Or if I were to hit delete, it would delete those script files. I can select on, on content type more granular. So I can say select, you know, image, whack, JP, and it's gonna find the JPEGs. In this case, uh, I think there was only one somewhere. Uh, I can find GIF files, which is probably a better example since there's lots of those in this repro. And so you can filter down to the traffic types that you care about. You can also do just a lightweight keyword. So you type a question mark and then start typing something and you'll find like web trends and it'll actually just filter down to that, that one specific session. And so you can do filtration in, in a very, very powerful way. You can also write your own rules. You could write a custom thing for your site that says, I only want traffic that's going to this host and it has, you know, this uh, request query string and so forth. It's, it's, it's all scriptable and it's pretty powerful. The last thing I wanted to mention is the find dialog. So you can actually search across all of your web traffic and you can say, I wanna search you know, for web trends and I will look in requests and responses. I only am interested in say the content bodies and I wanna decode those content bodies. And this is an important capability that you don't have to, with uh, a lot of the other tools is HTTP traffic might be compressed or it might be delivered with chunked encoding. And unless you remove that encoding, you can't actually see that content effectively. Well, decompre decode compressed content is actually gonna do that process for you and it's gonna find anything that uh, contains that, that keyword uh, and, and show it to you in plain text. Now, I actually have two demos here for, for Internet Explorer 8, some of the new features that we've added, and how you might use Fiddler to, to analyze those. So I'm gonna boot up a browser, and I'm gonna go to just a very trivial web page that has the address of the conference center. And the conference center uh, basically uh, is right here. And you know, it's an address, but it's not terribly useful. I really want a map. Now I can copy, paste, go up, load up Bing, paste in the address, and do a search. Or I can use an accelerator. And so in this case, what I'm gonna do, first I'm gonna go turn on Fiddler. Uh, F12 starts capture, or you can click down in the bottom left. And so I'm gonna turn on Fiddler, and I'm gonna click on the IE8 accelerators icon, and I'm gonna scroll down to the map with Bing entry. And you'll see that Bing uh, has, a, has an accelerator that, that plugs in and shows the map of, of the local area. Well, if we wanna see how effective was this out on the, the local network, uh, we'll find that our, our process filter apparently wasn't working, so let's go start that guy again. 
Either that or I've, I've already mapped this. One of the interesting things to keep in mind is, is that Fiddler is a proxy. It sees things that traverse the network. Well, the important thing about things that traverse the network is if they don't go over the network, you'll never see them. And so one of the things that you generally want to do when you're doing debugging with Fiddler is you want to make sure that your requests are getting made by clearing your browser cache. Usually a control F5 will be enough. Uh, but, but in some cases with the accelerators, for instance, there's nowhere for me to do that, that control F5. I'm gonna go turn off my filters, which were the real problem here. And I'm going to go map with Bing. And you'll see those requests are getting made out. And you'll see in particular that these requests are getting made uh, here we have this geotagger.aspx and it's got a query string and so forth. And if we go over and look in the inspector, we actually have a web forms inspector that'll decompose that query string out into the, the, the simple text fields. It'll do this for things like the, the post body as well. Uh, or you can take different views. For instance, I can look at the raw, the raw text here. Um, or if it was an XML query with an XML post body, I could take a look at that. There's different plugins that are very useful for different scenarios. So there's a JSON viewer that someone externally wrote that will actually decompose a JSON body into a clickable tree view. And another one is the ASP.NET view state inspector that will actually take the blob of hex encoded stuff that ASP.NET uses and decompose it into its fields and values. And so those are available for download as well. So in this case, however, you're gonna see that, hey, there's, there's the, the URL request there. I'm not sure what clean is. I don't know what dirty map results are, but uh, the size is going to be 320 by 400. The client is Internet Explorer and uh, the overall view is gonna be full. And we're gonna inspect this response using the WebView Inspector. The WebView Inspector is just a lightweight Trident instance, and it turns out that there's not a whole lot of interest inside this guy, uh, and so he's gonna get uh, the, the big red X of doom. I think we'll probably get a better useful, uh, a better thing here. Turns out the whole thing was a bitmap, and so there was no interactive content. The WebView will not make an HTTP request for you. It'd be very confusing if while you were analyzing your traffic, Fiddler was making HTTP requests on your behalf. And so the, 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 web, the WebView will actually just show you what the, the server got back with no external references. And so, you know, this is a very simple thing. IE8 accelerators allow for previews. They do simple HTTP traffic, things that you can look at. There's no particular wire formats involved. You can use whatever you want. The data goes out in a post body or a query string. Now there's a case where a new feature in IE8 where, where things are a little more interesting, and that's visual search suggestions. So IE8 has this feature where essentially in the search box of the browser, you can go and make queries for whatever you want. Now, as I mentioned back at the beginning, um, I'm, I'm all really about clip art, and so since my clip art days, I always search for cat. And so in our search box, we're gonna search for cat, and you'll see as I type the letters of cat, we're seeing HTTP requests that are appearing in the background. And the reason that we're seeing these HTTP requests is because of this feature called visual search suggestions, where as you make queries against a uh, search suggestion enabled provider, it'll send HTTP requests out over the wire and return back an XML body containing what should be shown in that view. In this case, it'll also provide some suggested images. And so if we go and look at our, uh, we have our thumbnails, and we can see actually that these thumbnails are a little bigger than they ought to be, right? Because the bitmaps are actually much larger than is being displayed. And so Bing could probably save on some bandwidth if they weren't making them so large. And if we use the XML view inspector to take a look at the response, you'll see that we've broken it down and we can actually see the individual uh, suggestions in this format. In this case, the use XML JSON is also available as a format, although I couldn't find a website that was using it. Traffic comparison is a great scenario because it's a really interesting thing for us very often to say, hey, this page worked in IE8, but it doesn't work in you know, a beta build of a future version. What happened? Well, you can actually take a traffic capture captured in uh, the older product, and you can compare it and actually wind diff the traffic between those versions. And so in this case, I, I actually did just a simple wind diff of a page that was using IE8 and a page that was using Firefox 3. All you have to do is in the session list, pick any two sessions that you know, should represent duplicates of each other and select them both and choose compare and it'll pop up a window view of the, the, the differences. There's some automated tools for doing analysis. So basically you just boot your app, you play around with it and when you're done, you get a report of the bugs in your app that you get to go file. 
Uh, there's a tool written by a, a security guy named Chris Weber, which is called Watcher. And Watcher does static passive analysis for security vulnerabilities in web applications. It basically looks to see, are you following best practices? Is there a possibility of a cross-site scripting injection or a CSRF attack in this content? It's available as a plugin. Basically, all you do is you load it into Fiddler, click Start, and then go surf your app, and it just finds bugs for you. We found a bunch of bugs uh, using this inspector, and there's a more advanced version that some of our security teams use internally. This is now actually part of the, the new version of the Microsoft Secure Development Lifecycle, so using Watcher against your web applications to make sure that there's no easily found uh, bugs. And you know, this doesn't supplant deeper analysis, obviously, but it will also show you things like hotspots, where there's a lot of possible attack vectors for a particular page on your site. And it gives ratings and severity so that you can prioritize your work. Traffic manipulation. Now here's the fun part. Fiddler is very useful for looking at traffic, but it turns out that it's, as it's placed on the network stack, it allows it to modify traffic. And this turns out to be tremendously useful. It's useful for, well, people that are doing bad things, you know, pen tests of your application, but it's also very useful for devs, web, web devs and client devs, just while they're debugging their own code. So let's talk about that. The first thing we have is we've got some very simple built-in rules. So on the rules menu, you'll, you'll see a bunch of the rules that are built in. These are actually mostly implemented in the script file. So if you want to see how they work, just click rules, customize rules, and you can go view your Fiddler script. But you can do very, very simple things like say, well, what would happen if all the responses were encoded? Could my client read those? Just click apply gzip encoding, and it will go do that for you. Or is my client smart enough to handle a proxy authentication challenge? Click require, require proxy authentication. You don't need to go install some you know, proxy to try it out. Uh, you can do things like change the, the uh, accept language. So there's require Jap uh, request Japanese client, which will go change the accept language sent by all the requests to see whether your server is pivoting properly on that header. The user agents one is one of my favorites. Basically, I can just go pick a user agent from this list, or you can add to this list, and say, hey, subsequently, all traffic that goes through me should look like it's coming from Safari or something else. One of the fun ones is actually change your user agent string to the Google bot and then surf around and see what different sites will give you. MSDN gives you a very flat, plain text version of itself because it figures, oh, you're a search engine, you don't need all this other stuff. Just get it the basic bytes. And so the, the rules menu is a very simple way to get these things, and you can go write your own. One of the most recent ones, which is very useful and a lot of people have commented on, is the host tab. The host UI allows you to seamlessly target any request for one host to a different host. And so in this case, I've got an example of, you know, say I work for production.com, and uh, I've got, uh, you know, my dev machine is currently hosting the production, it's hosting the web services, and it's hosting the data layer. Well, I don't want any of this stuff to hit production, but I don't want to change my client application. Well, just boot the host, go say, hey, I want all traffic for production.example.com, services.example.com, and so forth, to hit my dev box. The cool thing about this is it will even fix up the certificate for you. And so on your local machine, you know, you cannot have the, the, the actual trusted certificate, but you won't get any cert errors because Fiddler is seamlessly re-signing that traffic. And if you trust that cert, you're not going to get any errors in the browser. And so this is a very seamless way where you, can even, you could even do it against the live site and say, hey, we've rewritten you know, very little of the live site, just this one little piece. How much does it make a difference in terms of performance? Well, I'll take that one little piece, point it at your dev machine, and then cruise your production site. You'll have the request going into your internal site that you want, and then the rest of it will be handled by production. And so this is a very powerful feature. You can do deeper rewrites. You can rewrite post bodies, rewrite query strings, whatever you want. But this is, a, this is a feature which is very simple to use. Breakpoint debugging. This one, have you guys used breakpoint debugging? Anybody? That's, that's there we go. Um, it's, it's, it's really pretty amusing to me because this is a feature that I used all the time and it occurred to me that, you know, uh, I, I actually regressed it once and there was a bug in it and it didn't work for like three months and nobody mailed me and I thought, that's odd. I wonder if someone found a workaround. And I think the answer is actually very few people use breakpoint debugging. Breakpoint debugging works basically just like it does in Visual Studio. You break on a request, and so you say, I want a breakpoint anytime a request happens. Or you can say, I'd like a break for any particular URL you want. So I only want a breakpoint on ua.aspx, for instance. And then you can just get the opportunity to modify. So we're gonna do that really quickly. Down in our quick exec box, we're gonna type BPU, meaning breakpoint on URL, uh, ua.aspx. 
And then we're gonna boot our browser and we're going to go to a page containing ua.aspx. And you'll see Fiddler is uh, pleasantly paused right here, waiting for me to make a modification to the request. In this case, I'm going to say, rather than using uh, Internet Explorer with the MSIE9, this isn't actually IE9, I just send that UA string to mess with servers. I'm gonna change this to the links user agent string. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and clear that breakpoint. So just type BPU with nothing else. And I'm gonna say run to completion. And what you'll see in the browser is, the browser has no idea that any of this has happened. It's just has changed under its nose, and now the, the website thinks I'm using links and returns back, yes, you're using a very limited browser, it doesn't support you know, images or something like that. And so you can do these kinds of modifications. It's pretty painful though, because you have to do it on a one-off basis. And so for a lot of people, that isn't sufficient. They wanna do something that's a little bit richer. You can use the filters tab, as I mentioned previously, to add and remove request headers. So if you always want to fake your referrer header or you always want to flag content that's set in cookies, you can do so very easily with the filters tab. You can use the request builder, drag and drop requests over, make manual modifications. But again, you're still in manual mode. That's kind of annoying. That's where the autoresponder comes in handy. The autoresponder allows you to replace any response of your choice based on a regular expression or an exact URL with any local file that you want. And so you can do kind of fun things. And so hopefully I left the machine set up for this. We're gonna go over to the autoresponder and we're gonna say, hey, uh, if it matches this regular expression of image types, then return this local file, Eric and Bill. And we're gonna go to nytimes.com and see what's on the front page of the New York Times today. And hopefully we'll see, oh, there's me and Bill Gates. And so, you know, obviously it's kind of silly and ridiculous and the Flash ad doesn't uh, play very nicely with it. Ordinarily I block Flash using my content block extension. But overall, you can make these kinds of modifications. Now, you know, this is silly, but you could do something that says, hey, replace all GIFs with big green boxes. And then just load your site and see, oh, which are GIFs, which are JPEGs, which are pings. It's a very simple, lightweight thing to do. This was the Engineering Excellence Awards in uh, 2007. The other thing Fiddler will do for you, as it does handily here, is it says, hey, there's, and the New York Times server is actually not uh, using the HTTP protocol properly. Uh, session 223 didn't contain any headers. Uh, and that's because they have this streaming server thing, and Internet Explorer just happily reads the bytes, or Flash just reads them, but uh, Fiddler is uh, very particular about its HTTP traffic and will yell if there's any problem with it, and so you can fix those problems. You can do other things with the autoresponder. So for instance, uh, back when we made that request back at the beginning when we, when we changed our user agent string to links, you can actually just drag that guy over here. And so now anytime there's a request for the exact same URL here, you're gonna get that exact same response. And so in this case, I'm no longer gonna tamper with my traffic directly, but I'm gonna view that page again and you'll see, oop, previously cached response is already there. And so this is something that can be super useful uh, for a variety of different scenarios. My favorite one is the, the demo, the demo horror. What happens if you're in a conference room, you're demoing Internet Explorer and your network connection goes out? Well, your day is pretty much over. Well, Fiddler allows a very interesting possibility where you can import into the autoresponder previously captured traffic. And you can say, basically, hey, I'm gonna import the ACID2 HTTP responses and then I'm gonna boot my browser and I would pull the network cable, but frankly, I'm not that brave. So you'll just see in the background. I click ACID2, and you'll see that in the background, oh, I wanna go turn off that other modification because we don't really wanna, we don't really wanna replace uh, Bill and I for, for all of these things. You'll see that the network requests are actually going to be uh, handled by the autoresponder. And so even if we weren't online, we could actually successfully take this ACID test and see that it works properly. And you can tell which, which sessions have been returned from the cache because they're in this light blue background color. But the important and key thing about this is it's not just for doing offline demos. Previously I mentioned, hey, somebody in the field gives you this traffic that's got an error in it. You can just load it into the autoresponder and actually visit the site as if they had done it. And so you can see what they saw. And this is a tremendously powerful feature. I'm gonna get rid of our little smiley. Go back to our demos. Fiddler script has a rich syntax editing environment. Uh, basically the way that it works is Fiddler will call your script methods. It will say on before requests and it will give you an object that represents the request and you can go do whatever you want. You can eat the request, you can respond with a file locally, you can go modify it, you can go replace all instances of the word foo with the word bar. Um, it's actually useful for 
practical things as well, but it's, it's mostly fun to, to play around with for me. You can add additional columns to the session list view. And so, for instance, if your content always returns a header that contains the SQL server that the request was targeted to, you could actually just write a, a trivial little thing there, bind UI column, and actually have that HTTP header appear as a column in the response. And so you can just quickly surf around your site and see how things are going. Here's a simple request modification script. I say, hey, if the URL contains ASPX, then change it to red so I can look at those requests more closely. Or in the case, I've got a Boolean named disable caching, and I can actually, on the outbound request, just go remove all of the headers that would do a conditional request to the server. And so those will become unconditional requests, and the server won't give me back a 304. And so that's a very, very simple way that you can do modifications. You can do the same thing for responses. In this case, basically, this, this method will go decompress the response, remove any HTTP chunked encoding, and then it will prepend to that response body injected content. This seems sort of odd. Why would you want to do that? Well, one of the things that I think would be pretty cool is there's, there's various debugging scripts that might be useful, right? People have them in their production, they have them in their debug sites, but not on production. Well, with this, you can actually just make the script tag appear in your production code when you're surfing it, and you can see that change take place. Optimizing performance with Fiddler. When we first launched our new Clipart site back with uh, Office 2003, uh, the Clipart database servers were working great. They were cruising along, no problem. The front ends, on the other hand, were a little problematic, and that page of kittens took like 30 seconds in some cases to come up. And that just wasn't good enough. And so one of the early things that Fiddler was optimized for was tuning performance. And so Fiddler's got a bunch of features that are useful for that. The main thing to understand is, is that Fiddler will help make your website faster. It's not really about measuring how fast your website is so much, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. But how does it make your site faster? Well, one of the ways that it does it is it allows you to see very easily what is the request and response size. So you can say, these are the big requests, or these are the, the things that are much bigger than I expected. One of the first things that we found in the Office Online site was the EULA. When you clicked accept on the EULA, it sent 40K to the server when you clicked on accept. And we said, why could this be? And the reason it turns out is we had set, we failed to set the proper property on the ASP.NET text box, and so we were actually posting the whole EULA back to the server. Well, on a modem, 40K takes quite a while to upload. And so that was one of the, the you know, simple wins that we got. You can reduce round trips. Find cases where you're you know, using resources that you don't necessarily need to. Maybe in one case you capitalize the URL, and in the other case you didn't. Well, that's going to end up in two requests. You can minimize those. You can optimize compression. You can basically enforce compression for Fiddler and see how much are we going to save if we turn on compression. Or you can find the resources that are currently compressed or currently not compressed. Ditto with caching. What's compressed? What's not, or sorry, what's cached? What's not cached? And then the other fun thing you can do is you can experience the web at a much slower pace. So using the rules menu, you can just turn on this, this simple rule here, simulate modem speeds. And what it'll do is it'll actually narrow down your, your connection bandwidth. So you can control at a, at a you know, fairly uh, granular level how quickly are requests being returned from the network. Now, this is built in. Everybody's like, well, I want simulate DSL speeds, or I want simulate satellite speeds, or I want latency from here to Australia. It's all script. You can do whatever you want. You can add all of those. People have written extensions that add a bunch of different things that they can flip between. But overall, you have a bunch of power in Fiddler to do those types of simulations. There's other tools that work at lower levels. Microsoft Research works on crazy things like that. But this is a great way to go to a quick view of the perf. Of course, that's not really enough, because we're not all perf experts. We don't all know what we need to do. One of the guys who is a perf expert, Eric Mattingly, who works for Microsoft now on uh, our websites, wrote a plugin called Nexpert. And what Nexpert does is it will actually go do that expert analysis and find out, as your site loads, hey, wait, this isn't cached. Probably ought to be. Or, geez, this is kind of big. Maybe you can compress it. Here's exactly how much you would save if you were to compress it. And it will actually export this as a report. The other thing that's cool about it is it uses some Microsoft research technology to actually calculate what the anticipated response times are based on latency around the world. And it will say, well, actually, this, this page is not very fast if you're, if you're coming at it from this locale because you're making too many HTTP requests. So Nexpert is the sort of thing that I love seeing people do because it makes Fiddler way more powerful and I don't have to write any code. The one key caution about the perf thing is you have to watch out for the observer effect. People come to me and they say, I want to see packet fragmentation. I want to see retransmits. 
Fiddler's not about that. Fiddler's about optimizing your HTTP traffic. It's not about TCP IP. Well, you can get some low-level measures of like, hey, when did this request come back, or how long did this DNS query take? The fact that Fiddler is operating as a proxy changes the nature of your traffic. Some browsers will use different or more or fewer connections if a proxy's in play. Some of them will add or remove headers. Sometimes you'll get a pragma no cache header versus a cache control no cache header. There's different behaviors. So when you're doing the very, very fine level analysis, you don't want to use something like Fiddler because Fiddler can actually change things. Fiddler is about making your traffic smaller, more compressed, better cached, and so forth. But if you want the low level TCP IP level stuff, there's different tools. The biggest one, the biggest observer effect that Fiddler introduces is related to the fact that Fiddler allows you to do breakpoint debugging. Well, in order to properly do a breakpoint debugging, you actually have to collect the whole response to allow the developer to modify it. Well, during that process, none of those bytes go to the browser because the developer might want to change them. So by default, Fiddler operates in buffering mode, where it will actually contain, it will wait for the HTTP response to complete, allow any breakpoints before sending it to the client. Well, in a page load, in any browser, they all support incremental page load, this actually incurs a problem. So the top timeline is a timeline view of a buffered response. You'll see the HTML response in blue actually takes three full seconds to complete, and none of those bytes are sent back to the client. And so Internet Explorer just sits there for three seconds, and then when it gets the whole page in one shot, then it does all the sub-downloads of images. With streaming mode, it's an option in the Fiddler toolbar, Fiddler will actually stream those responses back to the client the byte by byte as soon as it gets them. The trade-off you make is you can no longer do breakpoint response debugging because those responses have already been sent to the client. You can still do the breakpoint re request debugging. And so in the lower case, you'll see the streaming mode, the transfer timeline, the, the first byte from the server comes back at one second and that immediately goes to the client and you'll see that the client opens that image request right away. So while you can disable the, the buffering mode to improve the overall fidelity and reduce the observer effect, there's still other low-level things. And for those types of things, you want to use Netmon and you want to use the Visual Real-Time Analyzer plugin, which was released for, for Netmon. Netmon has gotten a ton of work over the years. There's a really impressive team of guys working on it. They've made it very, very much simpler to filter down to a specific process. They've added tons of TCP IP level insight. And you can debug your SSL handshakes and do really neat things with Netmon and VRTA. But you can't do traffic modification, you can't send things to different servers and so forth. And so together, if, you're, if you want the full end-to-end -end experience, you need to use multiple tools. The other thing I should mention, since nobody seems to know it, is IE8 includes a pretty impressive set of new developer tools. If you hit F12, you can cruise around your DOM, there's a JavaScript profiler, there's a JavaScript debugger. The tools are way better than what they were in the past. Test integration, integrating Fiddler into your tools, making it part of your workflow. The first thing I mentioned was that, that execaction.exe, it's a standalone executable. It just passes a command string into Fiddler, Fiddler script or Fiddler extension can interpret it. If you're writing your own app, you can actually just do the same thing by posting a Windows message to Fiddler, because that's all exec action really does, is it just sends a message containing a string to Fiddler. And this works fairly well. I know some teams at Microsoft that have built kind of interesting automation on top of it. But there's a challenge with it, and the challenge is that all the Fiddler UI is still there. Fiddler has to load. Fiddler has its own UI, has its own quirks. Unless you turn, turn off all the prompts and so forth, it'll warn you if your traffic is malformed. It's not the seamless experience. To that end, there's a new component, which I'm announcing today, called Fiddler Core. Fiddler Core is a .NET class library written in C-sharp, which you can host inside your application. The difference is basically from the left to the right. Instead of your code being hosted inside Fiddler, you're hosting Fiddler Core's code inside your code. And this allows for some very powerful scenarios. You can build things like Fiddler Cap not knowing anything about proxies. Basically, you'll just get your own request, your own response. You can handle them in any way you want. You can build things that export traffic to files or log to databases with no UI. It allows for a very rich development experience. I'm gonna give you a very, very trivial demo of this because we're pretty much running out of time. But what we have here is perhaps the simplest possible Fiddler Core application. We're gonna close Fiddler. And this Fiddler Core application, basically all it does is a command line thing that will watch your HTTP traffic. And if we go load, say, bing.com, 
What you should see in the background is you will see that the Fiddler core starts getting the HTTP requests from the client. And uh, this is a very simple command line wrapper. It's literally like four lines of code, as you'll see in a second. But you'll see that the title contains how many sessions are in the list. And we can choose to list those sessions if you want. And you could save them off to a SAS file or do whatever you wanted. You could do test automation based on the responses and so forth. And the code is, is very, very trivial. So if we go over to our, our Visual Studio instance here, I'm not sure why it's not repainting properly. <laughs> there we go. Basically, all I do is I create a, a generic list containing Fiddler sessions. I tell Fiddler's configuration to ignore any server certificate errors. And I call startup and say, hey, go listen on port 8877. I want to be the system proxy, and I want HTTPS traffic. And basically, all of that traffic will flow through callbacks. And the callbacks are very trivial. Before request, passes a session object. I say, hey, I, I want to buffer that response, and I want to add it to the session list. And then before response, I've actually written something here that will decode that response and replace in the response user agent uh, with Fiddler. So this is kind of a trivial traffic modification scenario. But if we go back to our about blank and we go to the UA page, you'll see that all instances of the string user agent have been replaced with the string Fiddler core. And so you can do pretty cool things like this and build it into your app and build it into your tool chain. Just what we saw. What's next? Well, first thing is Visual Studio 2010 App Compat team mailed me and they said, hey, go recompile it against .NET 4 and tell us what happens. And exactly what I thought happened would happen. Everything except Fiddler Script works. And Fiddler Script doesn't work because the Visual Studio things have been deprecated for uh, quite a while now for, for JavaScript. And so for .NET 4.0, I'm gonna go need to move to some of the more interesting stuff. There's a session going on like two doors down about an hour ago about how to integrate Iron Ruby and Iron Python in your application in like four lines of code. It looked pretty hot. So I'm gonna go figure out how to do that. I already have an implementation of Fiddler that's running with C-sharp as the scripting engine. So if you're a .NET developer who likes C-sharp, it's pretty cool. But the key thing is, you guys tell me, right? Basically, I started this to debug clip art problems. Uh, we wouldn't have ended up here if that's really all that, uh, you know, it was all my idea. Virtually everything that has been added to Fiddler since then has come from the community. I believe the next slide is the question slide. Fiddler2.com Fiddler PDC has most of the key topics that I've talked about this, including the super secret download Fiddler core link, uh, because that has not yet been publicly announced, uh, because I just announced it now. Questions? <laughs>